well, good evening and welcome to everybody. Welcome to our regulars. And if you're a <coughs> first timer this week, then welcome to you too. My name is Alan Friedman. I'm Vice President of the Australian Jewish Association. And I am again your MC for this evening. And tonight I'm joined by Michael Bird, my former co-host of Nothing Left uh, for the evening. Good evening, Michael. Hey, good evening, Alan. Nice to be back together. And good, again. good evening, David, too. Um, so after escaping to Canberra last week, David Adler, president of the AJA, is back with us tonight. Uh, and uh, if there's any time at the end, he might want to tell us uh, in a few words what happened in, in Canberra last week. But we are delighted to welcome our guest speaker tonight in Stan Goodenough, who we will introduce formally in a moment. And tonight we're going to be hearing about all the controversial issues from someone who lives in Israel and is right on our wavelength. And I will point out that Stan happens to be in the Czech Republic at the moment because, uh, because uh, as a tour guide, there's not, not too many tourists around Israel at the moment. The format will be uh, as usual. Michael and I will chat with Stan for about 30 minutes, at which point we will open up for questions from the audience. And as I always remind people, um, the best way to get our attention is to raise your hand electronically. And if you click on the uh, participants icon, down at the bottom, you'll see a little uh, button that says raise hand, or if there isn't one of those, there's a green tick. Just let us know that you want to ask a question and we, we take them as they come. Uh, so uh, we'll get to you uh, shortly after about half an hour. The chat function is available as usual. And as usual, we always ask people to just uh, stick to the night's topic. Okay, well, Stan Goodenough is a journalist, writer, speaker, and accredited tour guide in Israel. Uh, if you want, you can Google uh, Zion Warrior Tours, Z-I-O-N, Warrior Tours. And he regularly visits Australia to speak to both Jewish and Christian audiences. Uh, Stan has been a friend of ours for many years and Michael and I enjoyed his regular contributions to Nothing Left over the five years that we ran that radio program. And Stan was always generous enough to make time for us whenever he was in Australia. Michael and I have often marvelled at the friendship we received from the, the Christian Zionist community, and this has easily flowed on and expanded as we moved from nothing left into the Australian Jewish Association. In fact, we've commented many times how we wish that some of our Jewish communal organisations were as friendly to and supportive of Israel as the Christian Zionists are. So it was gr with great pleasure that we're able to catch up again with Stan, this time on behalf of the AJA. Stan, good evening, our time, and thanks for joining us. It's nice to see you again. Thank you, Alan, and thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Stan, we'll, we'll get to some of the issues shortly, but um, we can't sort of start without asking you about the, the Israeli election. Um, it's obviously changing very quickly. Have you got any any latest information uh, on what's likely to happen? Um, it has literally been um, fluctuating through the night uh, since the closing of the polls. And the first um, exit polls were broadcast at 10 p.m. Israeli time last night. The initial, the initial um, outlook or an expectation was that the nationalist camp, which is to say the Likud, with the other right-wing parties, Shas and... Yamina as kingmaker would be able to get 61 seats uh, against the 59 seats of the um, of the left of the, they say the center left block but seriously it's a left wing block um, and then that number moved back and forth putting the left the left side uh, in front of the right side and then back again the latest that I've heard is that. The, uh, the breakaway Arab party that broke away from the Arab list, Ra'am, they were initially not able to get over the threshold with the initial uh, uh, projections. They are now over the threshold, at least they were when I last checked about half an hour ago. And uh, that has pushed the Likud, or rather the, the national camp, Likud and Yamina, down to about 59 seats overall, um, raising the specter of a... Of a, of a potentially a left-wing-led or directed coalition, uh, if they can even form a coalition. But it is super gridlock. It's pretty much the way it was after the last three um, cycles, as they're calling them. They're calling them election cycles now. <laughs> and they're talking about the fifth cycle. They're already talking about October this year as uh, the, the, the need for another election. 
um, it's really it's really stymied, and it, it's uh, well, it, all of us, depending on where we stand and and how we view the importance of the of the leaning of the Israeli government, it's uh, certainly for me it's uh, it's it's exasperating and distressing, um, a little bit con a little bit worrying because of the unfriendly uh, administration in the United States right now and Israel really needs, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, I guess, but Israel needs, um, in my understanding, needs a strong nationalist led government with a, a strong position on the, the sovereign land of Israel and against the Iranian threat, etc., to withstand the kinds of pressures that are already coming uh, full tilt, actually, often behind, uh, below the radar screen, but coming from the United States. So anyway, it's uh, there's no there's no clarity now yet. They say by Friday morning they should have the final tallies in. There, are some um, I heard six hundred thousand, but I have to check whether that's accurate. Um, So-called double envelope uh, votes that have to be counted from soldiers and others who couldn't get in. One one. Uh, uh, issue that was po possibly problematic, uh, maybe have been a logistical thing. My son, who flew back on Sunday, uh, he wanted to vote. He's in quarantine, and the system was supposed to provide um, a special taxi service for those in quarantine to be taxied to a uh, separate polling booth so they could uh, vote and then be taken back home. And he tried, he tried over and over again to reach these taxi companies. He couldn't get out the house. He couldn't go and vote. And the reports from Israel were that the 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 quarantine uh, uh, election uh, poll booths were all empty. That, that those people in quarantine were not getting through. Now, hundreds thousands of Israelis flew in over the last few days to vote. All of them would have to quarantine. Those that flew in this uh, yesterday would have been able to vote at the airport, but the rest were in quarantine. And I don't know how many of them managed to get out to vote. So there are there are issues like that. Okay. Uh Michael, did you have any questions on that? Yeah, uh, that's a worrying uh, concern, and I'm sure we're going to hear a bit more about that situation, about the quarantine issue, uh, Stan. Um, uh, before we leave the topic of the elections, how did Labor go? And um, I think you touched on the joint Arab list or, or the extension of that. What's, so particularly with, with Labor, what's happening with them? How did they go? Um, they they got in. I think that the, there was fluctuating polls again between seven and eight seats. I think at one point I saw they were down to six and then back up again. Um, the party leader, Michaeli, uh, she spoke briefly uh, invoking the legacy of the assassinated Prime Minister Hissak Rabin and saying that we they, she said, they murdered Rabin, but they didn't murder his path. And we're still here, and Labour's Labour's here to stay. And I would imagine, well, no, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to imagine, but yes, they're in at the moment. They're in with I think seven seats. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right, um, Stan. I mentioned uh, in my introduction, just before we get into some of the the, the, the issues, I mentioned mm -hmm. that we regard the Christian Zionists as great friends of Israel. But in case some of the audience may not be completely familiar of how the relationship works and maybe wondering if there is any attempt to convert Jews away from Judaism. Could you outline the Christian Zionist approach that you're involved with to, to Israel and the Jewish people? Um, sure. I um, uh, in, in My personal story is that I was raised in a, an evangelical Christian home um, in Protestant Christianity. Uh, where Israel was a non-entity, not 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 uh, relevant to my uh, young faith. It wasn't taught. Um, I never heard uh, any preacher say that Israel was no longer important to God, that Israel was no longer the chosen nation or anything like that. But in essence, that was the message that was somehow um, conveyed by simply not being addressed. And so Israel was not, Israel's significance um, to my faith and Israel's significance on the world stage today was not was not neither of those were relevant in my growing up. Um, but my parents were philo-Semitic and uh, my my mom played uh, Hebraic music around the house and I even learned to sing in Hebrew before I knew what I was singing about. Um, and I developed a, a desire to go to Israel out of apartheid South Africa, where there weren't many countries that we could visit. Uh, but there was the kibbutz experience and. I wanted to get there and um, put my feet on the ground and learn about Israel firsthand. By that time in my young adulthood, I was uh, growing more and more aware uh, of not only that Israel 
the nation and the, the people and the land that Israel was the source, the origin, the foundation of my Christian faith. Uh, but that Israel was still just as relevant in the purposes of the Almighty as uh, that nation has always been. Not only that, but that um, as a Christian who gets everything that I hold most dear to myself from the Jewish people, um, the history of Christianity, the way that the, uh, the Christian world um, frightfully devastatingly abused the Jewish people down through the centuries wherever they went and leaving a legacy uh, that uh, is deep in the minds of many of my Jewish friends who when they meet me they are suspicious about my agenda they do wonder you know what's in it for you why have why did I move to Israel why did I eventually stay there um, and um, and 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 my my uh, explanation, if I give it like that, is uh, I have everything that's everything that I hold dear comes from this nation. It is an incredible. It's incredible in its history. It has in, in it has an incredible future and destiny. And as a Christian, I want to stand with the Jewish people as they go into their destiny. I want to stand between Israel and a Israel hating world, and the majority of the world is an Israel hating world. And I want the Jewish people to know that I have um, nothing but love and appreciation for them, a belief in uh, an, an incredible respect for them and for their past and a belief in their future. And that in whatever way I can, I want to help stand with them into that future um, in whatever form that might take, encouraging um, my friends, my Jewish friends with uh, the promise of their future in, in, in times when there's a great crisis in Israel, when there are threats of violence that are escalating against Israel. I've had uh, the opportunity to express my confidence in Israel's security, because Israel's security is not in the hands ultimately of, uh, of any man, but in the hands of the one who watches over Israel and who doesn't slumber or sleep and who has made promises to Israel. So Christian Zionists, and I'm, I'm in that stream, Christian Zionists have understood and do understand that Israel remains a unique nation. Uh, it is the window through which we first view God, the Almighty. It is a nation that has taught us about who uh, he is and uh, the, the faithfulness of God in history to Israel. Uh, through all the ups and downs of, of, of the Jewish people's history uh, is a great bulwark and strengthener of my own faith because I believe in this almighty God who keeps his promises and he has kept them to the people of Israel and he exhorts us. And actually no Christian who believes the Bible, no Christian who believes the Bible can stand in any way in opposition to Israel, can do anything but support, comfort, encourage, um, and, and stand alongside the nation of Israel. And if at, at any time in history that would have been true, tragically, uh, it was very seldom the practice of Christianity. But in this, the, the last half of the last century, up until now, there is a growing awareness in Christianity, primarily evangelical Christianity around the world, that not only do we have this incredible debt that we owe the Jewish people in terms of what we've got positively from them, not only do we have this horrific history that we need to acknowledge and shun and, 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 and condemn of Christian anti-Semitism, uh, but we also have an, a nation that is thriving, growing, blossoming, and yet that continues to be hated uh, and, and condemned universally by the world. And, um, and we are to stand with, uh, with Israel, and we do as Christian Zionists, and we have no hidden agenda. We are not out to convert Jews to Christianity. Well, I'll, speak that, I'll say that for myself. I am not on any agenda. My, my support for Israel is without any, has no ties attached to it. And it's just, I'm with you. I've got so much from you and I want to be with you. And if I can be with you uh, as long as possible, after living in Israel for nearly 30 years, I only got my residency uh, just over a year ago. So it took a while, um, but I'm very, I'm very grateful and humbled to be able to call Israel my home as a non-Jew. Yeah, thanks, Dan. And I must say that uh, in the years that, I've been involved in, in Israel advocacy, and I'm sure Michael will agree. Um, we've never felt anything other than warmth and friendship from the Christian Zionist groups. And 
and you've just been fantastic friends. So long may it continue. So thank you for that, Michael. What? what have yeah. You got? Well, well, I'll I'll double down on that. I mean, if it, if, if anybody ever asked me to convert uh, to to Christianity, I'd say thanks, but no thanks. I'm, <laughs> although we're the most hated people on earth, I'm quite happy being a Jew. Um, <laughs> Stan. There's, uh, there's many uh, Christian evangelicals. Uh, America in particular has got uh, very many millions and they're very influential uh, in Washington. I think Mike Pence is an is a, is a evangelical uh, Christian. Um, uh, is, there just, is there more than one branch? Like, is, is there different types of, of, of evangelical Christians? Uh, is there one or is there one group or is there different type and they've got slightly different outlooks? How, how does it work? You know, Michael, I got my tour guiding call, my tour guiding license at a Jewish college in Jerusalem. And I was in a, in a room of, uh, of 40 students, uh, 38 were Jews and there were two of us who were not. And um, my, my fellow students asked me to try and explain, you know, where, where, you know, how does this all work in Christianity? There's Catholicism and Protestantism, and then there's evangelicals, and then there's uh, Pentecostals. And, you know, how, how does this all fit together? Do you get evangelicals in the Catholic Church? Please explain. And um, my response was, well, if you can explain to me the difference between the different sects in, and, and, and branches and streams in Judaism... I'll give it a shot trying to explain to you the different, shot, the different streams in Christianity. Look, in, some, in, in basic terms, an evangelical as opposed to an evangelist, an evangelist is a missionary. An evangelical is somebody who believes uh, in the evangel, which is the gospel. In other words, he's a believer in Jesus. He is a Christian. He's a believer. He believes that the entire Bible, that is to say the Jewish Tanakh and the New Testament, that it is all the... Um, the, the word of God and that everything that's written in it is, uh, is what guides him in life. And uh, whether he's a Methodist or an Anglican or a Baptist, he will hold up the Bible. And I've got one right here in front of me. He'll hold it up and say, I believe in this book and what it says. And you cannot believe, you cannot say you believe in the Bible and be anti-Israel. You just cannot. Uh, you cannot say you, 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 you base your life on the Bible and have anti-semitism in your bloodstream and anti-israel uh, attitudes in your heart the two don't go together the bible first of all it teaches us non-jews about israel and then it teaches us about our relationship with israel in terms of uh, where our faith comes from the roots of it and where it's going and the the restoration of the jews to their land and, um, and, and by the way, uh, I'm going to uh, I have the temerity to say to all the, uh, the dear Jewish people on this, uh, this Zoom that, um, that if you're not in the land of Israel, you are, you're not in exile, uh, you're not in diaspora, you're in captivity, right. according to the Tanakh, and you need to get out of, out of prison and come home uh, to Israel. That's what, uh, that's what the Bible says, and that's what the Almighty says, your home is there. Um, Whatever, whatever the stream of, of, of Christianity, if it is Bible believing and it will not question and it, and, and it will not uh, betray what, or deny or go against what's written in the Bible, there you will have your evangelical stream. And out in that stream, not all of them, because they don't all have the teaching, there's a, there's a lack of education. Uh, we, are, we are not so much taught what's known as replacement theology um, in so many words as it is conveyed to us uh, in ev evangelicals as well that we are that because Israel did not accept Jesus as Messiah uh, they ceased to be God's chosen people and Gentiles or, or Christians became the new uh, chosen people of God and that's heresy it is heresy uh, that, uh, that that calls God a liar uh, the, the Almighty has said that as long as the sun and the moon and the stars hang in the sky Israel will remain a nation before him, and his promises to Israel are, of course, irrevocable. So um, that evangelical, you'll find evangelicals in many denominations, um, you know, in many streams, but you won't say that that is your denomination. You're not, you're, not, you're, not a, you're not an evangelical by your denomination, but in the denomination you're in, usually Protestant, uh, you will be an evangelical. I don't know if that's any help at all. That's, that's good. Okay, let's, let's get into some of the hot issues. Michael, do you want to start? 
Yes, um, well, we've got a breather from the now disproven two-state solution uh, stand during the Trump years, but this now seems to have been revived by the Biden, uh, I call it the Biden squad administration. How do you view this situation? Um, look, the, the, the two-state solution is, uh, it, 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 there, are, there are two things that I consider the two-state state solution to be. The two-state solution is, uh, first of all, um, a, an internationally um, motivated effort to rob the Jewish people of their land. That's what it is. It's to create in the uh, most important parts, the most historically valuable parts uh, of the Jewish national home, uh, an enemy state. Uh, at, at the expense of the indigenous people who are the Jewish people. Uh, it is immoral. It is, uh, it is it, it, on every level, it is bankrupt. There is no argument you can make for a two-state solution, whether it is um, Israel's ability to defend itself when it's confined, as the newspapers were reporting this morning, um, to the nine-mile wide or the 13-kilometer-wide narrow waistline uh, between what would be Palestine and Netanya, for example, uh, with no strategic depth left to Israel, the high ground given over to those who get great joy out of firing rockets into Israeli cities as, as they tried from Gaza again during the, uh, the, the voting yesterday. Um, it, is, it is historically bankrupt because the people to whom the world insists Israel should surrender half of its, of, half of its land are not a nation. They have no national history there. They have no artifacts, no historical archeological proofs of a previous existence, neither in Judea, Samaria, nor in Jerusalem. They have no claim that they can base on any kind of historical documentation as a nation to that land. Uh, it's not the world's land. I, I, I'm in the Sudetenland, or I'm near the Sudetenland. I'm in the Czech Republic right now. Um, and not far from here, uh, back in the 1930s, the powers of the day uh, told the Czech people, you have to give away land for peace, uh, give away to Adolf Hitler the Sudetenland, and we'll avoid another world war. The whole idea of land for peace uh, has no, there's no precedent for it that it works. And when it comes to other nations telling an indigenous people that they have to give away their land, I mean, I know in Australia, the indigenous um, history and sensitivities to the to the First Nations and the Aboriginal people are very, very finely tuned. It's a, it's a big issue there. Can you imagine? I'm just thinking this off the top of my head. Imagine if, uh, if the world powers or the superpowers or the, or the rest of the international community uh, said, to, um, said to the Aboriginal Australians, you need to surrender all of the land that you have, get, get out, get in canoes, go somewhere else, leave the land. It's, it now belongs to another people who until 120 years ago had no national history there. And I'm not trying to draw too many parallels, but to, but to show the, the chutzpah, the nerve, the, uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's criminal that Israel, uh, the Jewish people, after they have barely survived, and I really want to stress this point because every year we hear the, the pledge never again coming out of the mouths of leaders in Europe and Australia and, 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 and the United States as they stand and they bow their heads in, 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 in um, memory of those who were slaughtered, the Jews who were slaughtered in the Holocaust, they say never again. And then this nation that dragged itself out of the death camps back to their original land, which no other nation had ever owned, and, and, and brought miraculously the land back to life, instead of it being a haven for the Jews, is actually the most dangerous place on earth, in a sense, for the Jewish people, because everybody around them hates them and the international community condemns them left, right, and center. It's criminal the way the world um, tries to uh, impose on the Jews. Uh, this state, and I haven't even begun to talk about the makeup of the people to whom the world wants to give the state, the people who brought awareness of their so-called cause to the world stage by hijacking airplanes and introducing the world to international terrorism until they did that in the 1970s, nobody even knew there was a Palestinian cause. And, um, and everybody's, everybody's uh, um, sold out to it. Every single nation, Australia as well, everyone supports a two-state solution. Donald Trump was a breath of fresh air. Um, he was totally, uh, he, 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 he went against all this 
Um, and you know what? He was right. He was, he was, he was right morally. He was right historically. Uh, he was right in terms of what's fair and what's just. He was right in terms of international law when he got Mike Pompeo to say Jewish state, the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria are not illegal under international law. He was right. He was telling truth. He was telling truth when he said the Golan Heights was always Israel's in, the, in, in, in antiquity. And it's never, except for a few short years, been Syria's. And Syrians only used it to, uh, to, to attack, attack the Jewish communities. He was right. Israel should keep the Golan Heights. And he was dead right when he said Jerusalem is the capital, the capital of Israel, and moved his embassy there. I mean, he was, he was, he came and he's gone, but please God, in my heart, he's not gone forever. Yes. Uh, but Joe Biden, or you, you, said the, the, you said the Biden squad, I say the Biden, Harris, um, uh, um, yeah, well, whatever. Anyway, the new administration, um, yeah, they're just, they just setting the clock back. And and they're and they're doing it really really quickly. And there are some very disturbing um, events taking place. Even just the day before yesterday, um, can't remember the source now. I'll, I'll go back and look for it in a minute if I need to. Um, but apparently, beginning in January, discussions were held with the Jordanians about permitting American troops to be based on Jordanian soil. And two days ago, the agreement was signed, bypassing the Jordanian Parliament signed by the king and um, allowing American troops, armed uh, American soldiers to in fact be based in Jordan, which is between Israel and Iraq, which is under threat from Iran and Iran itself, of course. And this right at a time when Israel is saying, um, there's no way that the United States should go back to the agreement with Iran. There's no way that they should go back to that agreement. And Joe Biden is saying, well, we're going to, we want to get back into the agreement and is discussing as I'm sure you know, I don't know if you're going to go into this today, but realigning the entire Middle East away from the Sunni Arab alliance that Donald Trump uh, established and, and, and cozying up to Iran again and actually at the, uh, at the expense of the Sunni Arab alliance and at Israel's expense. Um, the two-state solution is, uh, has been proven. <laughs> if anybody was a, uh, a real believer in the two-state solution, back when it was called a few other things, the Oslo Agreement, the, uh, the, the Roadmap to Peace, uh, the, um, the Annapolis version of it, uh, the two-state agreement, <clears throat> uh, or the two-state solution has no way, there's no way it works. Everything has been tried from when Israel gave away everything in the beginning, it surrendered territory, gave, allowed the Palestinians to be armed um, and, and, and and uh, began to actually force its own people to leave their homes. Uh, Israel has bent over backwards to actually try and, um, and meet the demands of the world that a two-state solution should, come to, should, should, should be imposed or should come into being. And the other side, which does not want a two-state solution, but a removal of Israel, uh, has, has never really cooperated in any way whatsoever. Yeah. If anything, you should tell the Biden administration that the two-state solution uh, is, uh, is, is, is a dead-end road then the Palestinian Arabs and their behavior should, yes. in my opinion. Yeah, well said. Stan, just to develop that a little bit, the, the, the Palestinian narrative has been one of an indigenous people that's been dispossessed from their tra traditional home, the homeland by the colonizing Jews. Now, from where I sit here in captivity in the, in the diaspora, um, I, I just wonder whether Israel has been active enough um, in challenging this, because it just seems to be such a no-brainer. Um, has Israel been on the front foot enough about, about this issue? Um, uh, in a word, no. Um, in a word, no, I think, I think it was uh, Shimon Perez, um, the late Shimon Perez, who, who went on the record many years ago now, uh, as saying that Israel doesn't need to, to really invest in Hasbara, in public relations. Um, look, there is the, the biggest press corps in the, the biggest international press corps in the world, uh, apart from Washington DC, uh, is situated in Jerusalem. And they churn out a huge amount of material that supports the Arab narrative, which you've just outlined there. Which, and, and it's interesting, it's changed a little bit because I think Time Magazine ran a piece in the late 90s. Um, Time Magazine, uh, no, sorry, excuse me, National, uh, forgive me, sorry, Time Magazine. I've got issues with Time Magazine, but this isn't that, that one. 
National Geographic ran a piece, um, a feature about the Palestinians as being descended from the Philistines. And um, uh, that was that was most of all it was worth by the Arabs until Saeb Erekat, uh, I think it was him, uh, an, an advisor, senior advisor to PLO, uh, Chief Arafat, um, said, oh, no, no, we are descendants of the Canaanites, which means we preceded the Israelites, which means our, well, I mean, it's, it doesn't take, I'm, not, I'm no scholar. <laughs> you don't need to be a scholar. Uh, the evidence is glaring that that's all, um, that's all fabricated nonsense. The Arabs, there are a lot of Arab nations. There are, sorry, there are a lot of Arab states, but there's really, really one Arab nation, and they come from Arabia, and they are the occupiers in the Middle East. And all the countries that today exist in what was the Ottoman, or the Ottoman Empire, all the Arab states, they're all brand new. They, are far, they have far less legitimacy, historically speaking, than the tiny little Jewish state that was carved out or, or, or half carved out, uh, thanks to Mr. Churchill, half uh, dismembered. Um, the, but no one questions the, no one tries to, of course, to delegitimize Jordan or Syria or, or any of the Arab states that uh, would, were kind of crafted by the British at the end of World War I. So um, um, th th there, is no, there is no evidence, there's no historical documented evidence, and as I mentioned earlier, there's no archaeological evidence, no proof whatsoever of a Palestinian nation in that land whose roots go back. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you may have um, read the uh, remarkable work by a, a woman by the name of Joan Peters, who it's uh, from Time Immemorial. Uh, she, I think she's passed now, but she, she, she set out to write a, a book in support of the quote unquote poor Palestinians and all of her research, which took her into the archives from London to Moscow, throughout the Middle East and parts of the British empire, all her research led her to the absolute conviction that the Palestinian nation is a fraudulent um, people. They're not a people, they have no national history there. But the journalists who gathered together at the American colony and, and, and trade uh, their angles on the stories that they're gonna report on out of Israel, collaborate, all of them, on supporting the Arab narrative. And Israel, hey, Sorry, I'm not, I'm not, no, I better not say anything to, to stand on your feet, Alan and Michael, because I did in the studio one day. Will you forgive me if I do this? Yeah, of course. <laughs> you, you, that was the first time we, I sat with the left, um, Nothing Left uh, radio program, and one or both of you, and I'll, I'll leave it up to you to decide who it was, uh, referred to a place called the West Bank. <laughs> and I, I said to you, and we were live, and I said to you, I'm deeply sorry to offend you, but I, I can't understand why a Jew would use a term that was coined that actually robs you of your, of, of your historical connection to the land. The Jerusalem Post, which under David Barilan, a personal friend of mine way back um, before he became advisor to Mr. Netanyahu, um, was a good newspaper that stood on Zionist values. Today, it's a left-wing rag. The Times of Israel, David Horowitz, they're horribly left-wing anti anti Netanyahu, anti-Trump, anti-settlements, anti... Arut anti um, Sheva is about the only voice we get um, in, Israel, in Israel that tries... Oh, and an incredible organization called the Woman in Green, Women for Israel's Tomorrow, who, two women, I remember them banging pots and pans, walking down the road outside the president's residence in Jerusalem after the signing of the Oslo Accords, saying this can't, this can't happen. And they then just just a just a handful of women, not political people. Um, they they are responsible for the birth of the sovereignty movement, which today has um, incredible support throughout the land. So many so many Israelis today support the effort to extend uh, Israeli law, uh, Jewish sovereignty over Judea and Samaria, and finalize and, and put an end to this to this lying land grab. But of course, I don't know about the Hasbara failings of the, the, foreign, the foreign ministry in Israel, but what about the incredible uh, land grab that's happening in Israel, in the, in, in the heart of Judea and Samaria right now? You drive through Judea and Samaria, and all you see are mushrooming cities, empty apartment blocks by the tens of thousands, I'm not exaggerating, or huge mansions and beautifully designed and um, manicured um, park cities 
for the Palestinian Arabs in Area C, which is supposed to be an area that was under the Oslo Agreement was supposed to be entirely under Israeli control. The Palestinian Arabs were, were to have no right to, to build there. They're building en masse. Go to the website of Regavim and, and, and they track and they film and the Israeli government is doing nothing to stop this fact. You know, it was a Zionist trick. It was you guys. It was the Jews who went into Palestine and moved around through Palestine late at night and put up the tower and stockade settlements and established a Jewish presence because they knew where Jews put their feet down, they'll, they'll be able to hold onto the land. Well, the Palestinian Arabs have learned that lesson well, and they're putting their feet down everywhere. And the Israeli government's doing this much that I'm aware of to stop it. It's, it's, it's disheartening, to put it mildly. Yeah, yeah. Look, we'll, we, um, there's lots more that Michael and I could ask you to understand, but we'll go to, we'll go to the audience questions. Um, mm. I've got Ron, Jeff and Dennis. Just before we go to Ron, uh, there is a written question from Elaine, and she's asking about um, Reverend Stephen Sizer in the UK. Now, that name doesn't mean anything to me, but uh, mm. can, you, can you tell us a little bit about him? Um, okay, in an indirect way, uh, I think it was in 2009 or 2010 that a meeting, um, a conference was held in Bethlehem. It was called Christ at the Checkpoint. I think that was the name of the conference, Christ at the Checkpoint. It was an, now, the, the, and this is where we, this is where obviously we realize just how, how big a job we have on our hands as evangelicals. It was an evangelical conference. It's still ongoing, although not in Israel anymore, and I'll try and explain why in a moment. Um, it was hosted by the Bethlehem Bible College, and it brought in clerics. Uh, at, at the top um, of, the, of the guest list was Stephen Sizer, who is an Anglican priest with a parish in England, um, and who has quite a, quite a reach through his books and through, I think, radio programs. I'm not sure of his whole um, CV, but he has... He has been promoting Palestinianism and condemning Zionism, and he's very anti-Semitic, outspokenly anti-Semitic, propagating lies about the Jewish people, propagating lies about Israel as a state, as a nation state. And uh, he was the, he was the um, I think, the, uh, the eminent speaker at this first, in the first, uh, the first edition of this Christ at the Checkpoint Conference was a very small affair. Uh, it, became, it was initially uh, held every other year. It grew in number. It became a... Uh, a hate fest, an anti-Israel hate fest, as people flew into Ben Gurion Airport and then were driven through the wall around Bethlehem and uh, and were given for the next seven days, I guess it was, um, filled with poisonous anti-Semitism as Christians in a Christian evangelical gathering. And Stephen Sizer was very big behind this. Um, he is he is in look. This is the this is the shameful history of our Christian past. Mainstream Christianity from the second century in the common era, mainstream Christianity has embraced this heresy that God is fed up and done with the Jews because the Jews killed Christ, which is obviously the, 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 one of the worst uh, um, um, lying charges leveled against them because, of course, it wasn't Jews who killed Jesus. It was Romans anyway. But the Jews rejected Christ, and so God rejected them, and so we, the church, Christendom are now the, the new people of God. That, is, that has been main, the, the broad river of Christianity for the last 2,000 years, and until today it remains the broad river of Christianity. Go to the World Council of Churches, uh, all the congregations, all the denominations that are part of that group, very anti-Semitic, very anti-Israel. Um, and Stephen, Stephen Sizer represents them. Okay. Thanks, uh, thanks, Dan. Okay, let's get to the audience. Ron, you're, uh, you're first off, so... Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hear me? Yep. Hey. Hi, good evening, Stan. My name is Ron Ankanama Kennis. Nice to hear from you. Ah, uh, you're the accent. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, you. You have, um, in a de facto way, you've repudiated the, um, the uh, idea, the, uh, the concept of eternal witness that was formulated by um, church founder Augustine eternal witness, whereby Jews would be condemned to pariah status, always wandering, never to be loved, and never to have their own home, which was, you know, which was why they wandered throughout Europe. And it's been transformed onto this eternal witness concept 
onto the state of Israel by mainstream <coughs> European countries and Christianity. How can um, evangelicals like yourself formally repudiate and try and reclaim um, a different kind of a narrative from early church founder Augustine, um, you know, which is also uh, underpinned by people like Shikani and Tutu and people like that. But there are people like Clive Mashishi and the African Christian Zionists as well, and also African, uh, sorry, Afro-American um, um, Zionist churches. How can you connect and formally try and get this idea of eternal witness repudiated? Because that's where it comes from. So Israel is the um, is the pariah state of the United Nations, for instance, you know, with chapter sevens and all that kind of stuff. But that is where it originally comes from. How can it be formally repudiated? What can you do about that? Uh, Ron, I wish I had an, uh, I had a very um, optimistic and promising answer for you. Um, fact is, I don't really. Um, certainly, uh, individuals, individual ch church leaders, um, and um, uh, pastors and 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 other other others in in uh, different Christian organizations like the International Christian Embassy, Bridges for Peace, um, Christians for Israel, um, they have you know they they have publicly repudiated all these um, these charges against the Jewish people, uh, all these these her heretical concepts and ideas. Um, the only the authority that they hold up in repudiating is the Bible once again. Uh, the fact that the Jewish people lost their land, lost their temple, lost Jerusalem, uh, that two-thirds of them were decimated by the Romans and the rest were scattered into the world to wander the world, isn't, has nothing to do with Christianity or with the time of Jesus. It has to do with Moses, uh, who warned just before, he, uh, just before he died on Mount Nebo, he warned the Israelites that if they were unfaithful to God, uh, God would curse them, and if they continued in their unfaithfulness, eventually the land would spew them out, and they would wander the world, and they would live in fear, and everybody would hate them. That's something that the God of Israel told his beloved Israel would happen to them, and it did. And because that's the history of Israel, it's, it, it was the history leading up to the time of Christ, and it's been the history since then of their, their, their wandering. It's not, a, it's not a Christian teaching, it's a Tanakh truth that the Jews out of their land were experiencing God's disfavor because of their unfaithfulness as a nation. But, but God, the same God who said that they would be driven out, promised that he would watch over them, that he would not leave them, abandon them, and that he would gather them back and keep them in their land as a shepherd keeps his sheep, and that he will rejoice over them to do them good. Um, so what, what, I guess what people like uh, the early church fathers and others who, who, who fed on the, the early uh, milk of, of Christian anti-Semitism and, and spread it, uh, through the early Gentile Christian world, um, they, they came up with their own theology and their own um, a, a reasons for, uh, for, the, for, the, for, the un, for the misfortune of the people of Israel. Um, to repudiate it, certainly we can, as uh, my wife, when she was uh, a young woman, she was in Spain, the year when, this, when, when, when Christians in Spain were remembering the expulsion, the mass expulsion uh, by Ferdinand and Isabella of the Jewish people from Spain and churches in different parts of, of Spain back in 1991 uh, were holding um, public meetings where they were uh, um, acknowledging the awful crime that their country 400 years before had committed against the Jewish people and um, and, 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 and begging forgiveness, well, of course, that's a, that's a whole different discussion about asking forgiveness for people who are already who are no longer here. But nonetheless, they rejected what their uh, forefathers had done. Um, there are, in Christian Zionism, in, the main, in, in, in Christian Zionism uh, across the different organizations and in churches that do hold to the Bible, uh, there is a rejection, a complete rejection of the, of the lying charge that the Jews are Christ killers who deserve to be punished and hounded and, 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 and wander the world um, for, their, for, their, for their sin. So, um, but, but when I say that, when I say that I'm not, I don't have a very optimistic answer, it's still, it's still mainstream Christendom that is, that is where I was growing up as a boy. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them outspokenly, like you two, outspokenly supporting um, this uh, liberation theology, which is also heretical, and um, uh, and others just in ignorance, just because they weren't told. So we're trying to we're trying to tell them bridges for peace. And I know, I've noticed that one of their representatives is here, was maybe left 
um, um, they, they they have a whole arm a uh, part of their, their ministry and I was on their board for 12 years is to educate Christians about the truth about um, what we have done to the Jewish people as Christianity and in fact what we should have been doing and what we're and what we would and what we do today which is to stand with you good on you uh, just a reminder please keep the questions brief Jeff uh, your turn um, please unmute yourself and ask your question Am I on? Yes, you are. Okay. Ron should actually edit half of what he says and delete the other half because he actually repeats himself and doesn't seem to realize that. And not only that, he embarrassed you. There's no reason for that. So here's my question, nice and short. Is it reasonable to hope that the Harris administration will so overreach in their evil acts and mishaps that they will be unelectable in two and four years' time? Short and sweet, Ron, that's how to do it. Okay. So the question is, is, is the, the, the Biden-Harris uh, administration uh, doing, doing damage to themselves? What do you think, Stan? Look, I think they're going to do, uh, I think they're going to do a lot more damage to Israel before, they, uh, are, before their four years are up at the, at the pace at which they're moving and the program that they have in mind and the people that they're talking to. Um, I think we will, those of us non-Americans like myself who were very much hoping that Donald Trump would win uh, another four years because he managed to do so much good in four years. He, he basically um, began reversing the track that America had been on under the previous administrations, whether they were Republican or Democrat. Um, but Biden is picking up. In fact, I think Obama is probably behind there somewhere pulling the strings, picking up where Obama left off. They've had four years to plan for this and they are racing ahead very quickly. And they have massive popular support, yes. Uh, depending on how you, where you stand on the on the whole thing about the, the fraudulent election, uh, 70 million people voted for Trump, but many, many, many tens of millions voted for Biden, if you believe that or not. The trend in America is to support the, the policy and the worldview of the Democrats. And I'm not so sure, unless they do something um, that I can't foresee at the moment, but certainly they could, because when you play with fire, you're going to get burned, and they're playing with Iran, and they're, they, they're trying to get back into bed with Europe, um, which, is the, which is basically coming apart at the seams at the moment. I mean, there are a lot of other things that could happen, not to talk about China um, and where that could all go. Um, but I don't see at this point, I wouldn't be able to say with any confidence that they would be, that they're, that they're setting themselves to be unelectable uh, in, in four years time. I think, they, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's a good chance, if chance is what it's all about, that, uh, the policies that they are now pursuing, they could pursue for another four after this. Mm, so yeah. Okay, uh, Dennis and then Debbie. So Dennis, please unmute yourself. Okay. The Abra Abraham Accords have shown that, the, that Arab countries are now prepared to have relations with Israel and they have left behind them the Palestinian cause. I mean, it was one or the other effectively. Uh, the facts on the ground in what the rest of the world calls the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, is that there are now 600,000 Jews living in Judea and Samaria, and it's growing rapidly. Given that it's quite possible that Naftali Bennett will be a part of, the, of, of a right-wing government in Israel, if the exit polls that I'm reading at the moment uh, are to be believed, what do you think would happen... If Israel uh, declares sovereignty under Naftali Bennett of the West Bank uh, and calls it Judea and Samaria. Um, hey, Dennis. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, just at, just at the moment, we were discussing. I think before the meeting got officially underway, just the the total unpredictability of this, the outcome of this election right now. I, uh, Bennett and his Yamina party were, according to the polls leading up to the elections, were, were looking at 12, 13 seats. They ended up with seven or eight, uh, which means they are, they are potentially a kingmaker that if Netanyahu can put together the, the other numbers and he just needs the extra seven seats to push himself over 60 to 61, uh, Yamina would be a part of that. But because they've only got, because Yamina and Bennett only have um, six, seven, maybe eight seats, uh, they're 
uh, uh, balance uh, ability to influence um, uh, or to pressure or to or to demand um, any kind of uh, premiership or partial or rotating premiership. I think that if there, if there ever was any, and Netanyahu was very clear from the start that he wasn't interested in in rotating with Bennett. Um, I think that's a very very at the moment it seems very unlikely that Bennett's going to assume that position. Um, Bennett is very strong on sovereignty, and as a minister potentially in the in the new government, if that comes about, um, hopefully, please God, he would be able to uh, bring the whole sovereignty question much closer to the to the top of the of the of the to do list of the new administration in Israel. Um, and there is uh, widespread national support now for sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. Um, the uh, the the new administration in Washington, of course, is is now totally opposed to that. Whereas the previous one was giving uh, giving uh, quite a lot of room, and when it came to the Abraham Accords, I have to say personally that I everybody says it didn't cost Israel anything, uh, cost the United States some F thirty fives. It didn't cost Israel anything. It was it was basically uh, peace for peace, not land for peace. But but there was land for peace in this that the that the, 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 the promise held out by the deal of the century uh, where Donald Trump said he would basically allow Israel to extend sovereignty over parts of, as a first step, Judea and Samaria, that all came to a, a, dead, a dead screeching halt. And the Abraham Accords came, in a sense, uh, in their place, in their stead. Um, and Israel had to let uh, sovereignty go in order to clinch the agreements with the Arab Emirates, the United Arab Emirates and, and Bahrain and the other states. Um, now, the, uh, the Abraham Accords now, I just want to applaud because it's just, it's incredible that there are these, um, you know, that these, these, uh, these countries that for so long, that there was a wall-to-wall anti-Israel Arab world is no longer true. The Middle East is very, very different. And yes, the Palestinian veto, as it's called, has been shown uh, up to be false. The, the Palestinian Arab uh, um, insistence that, and the Arab state's insistence that the Palestinian question first be dealt with, that a state of Palestine first be created uh, before um, any Arab state would recognize Israel or normalize with Israel, that's, that's now history. That's not gonna happen that way. However, Biden is trying to reverse that. Um, and he's even turning the screws on the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain uh, to, um, to now to begin to level demands in Israel's direction about the two-state solution to get them on board at the, at the potential risk of rupturing these new relationships. Um, so there's some, some pretty dastardly stuff happening. Uh, at the moment, I'm not particularly just looking at it horizontally. Um, I'm not particularly optimistic that, um, that, uh, that the, the international community is, has, has lost its, um, um, its commitment to the two-state solution. I think that, that pressure is gonna build on Israel again. And I don't know what it's going to do in regards to the Abraham Accords. I don't know how that's going to play out. It depends on the government. Mm. Okay. Now we're, we're running up uh, to time. Debbie, um, please unmute yourself and ask, and ask your question. Okay. Um, when the State of Israel was formed you know, as a Jewish state, they had to assure the United Nations that uh, they would look after the non-Jewish population, as, you know, not just the Jews. Now, um, what do you suggest to, um, should be the ideal solution for this you know, in lieu of a two-state uh, solution, like you know, for, for the Arabs under you know, um, Palestine control? All right, so going quickly back, uh, thanks, David. Going quickly back to the Balfour Declaration, um, although it was originally just a statement of government intent of England, of, of, of Great Britain, uh, it did stress that the support for a national home for the Jewish people uh, had to ensure that that national home had to ensure that it protected the, the, the basic civic rights of the other inhabitants of the land. It said nothing about national rights. It said nothing about um, um, offering them any kind of autonomy, just that they would not be uh, oppressed, uh, become a second class oppressed minority in the new Jewish national home. With the creation of the state in 48, uh, leading up to that creation, the different uh, Zionist leaders uh, held out from Weizmann, Ben Gurion, held out their hands to the Arabs uh, over and over again, and said, "Let's find a way to do this together." And increasingly, of course, the um, the the new um, spawned Palestinian Arab movement uh, would uh, channel 
um, Arab rejection and hatred of the of, of this new Jewish state or this reborn Jewish state uh, to the place where um, where all the Arabs that were not actually Israeli citizens after the creation of the state, those who didn't flee, those who stayed behind became citizens, where the rest were united in their in their hatred of Israel. But the Arabs um, in inside Israel uh, today they live um, Israeli Arab, they Palestinians. Uh, their brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and uncles and aunts are in the Palestinian Arab side. They are Israeli Arabs and they enjoy the highest standard of living, the only free democ uh, democ democratic uh, country to, in the entire Middle East, um, in the entire Arab world. They love being part of the Jewish state, no matter what comes out of their mouths, because it benefits them in so many ways. And, uh, and Israel is not, a, is not a racist state. It is not an anti-Arab state. So the Arabs who live inside Israel um, are, pr are protected by Israel. They're represented at every level. They are equal under the law. You've heard the, uh, the charge that Israel is an apartheid state. Well, the South Africans on the Zoom and myself who grew up in apartheid know that there the couldn't be a bigger lie virtually, except perhaps the one that says that the Palestinians are a nation. And um, <clears throat> so as, as far as, the, as, far as the, the Arabs who live under Israeli sovereignty are concerned, they're taken care of. The other Arabs, the, their family members who are in the Palestinian Arab um, group, if you like. Now, what is the solution for them? Well, I know this isn't going to go down well at all. And, it, and, and everybody's going to say it's undoable. But actually, it's just a matter of international law. Uh, the Arab world, the Arabs, the Palestinian Arabs are Arabs. Uh, the Arab world is huge and extremely rich. It has a lot of, a lot of room and it has a lot of, a lot of wealth. And, it, and, and, and it's the natural cultural environment for the Palestinian Arabs to live in and thrive in. And they could, if the Arabs were told, if the pressure was taken off Israel to find a solution for a problem that Israel did not create and was put on the Arab states to find a solution for the problem that they did create. And they were told, this is your problem. You caused this, you, you take care of it. We'll help you, we'll stand with you, the international community, but it's up to you to resolve. The Palestinians are suffering because of the Arabs, not because of the Jews. And it's totally wrong. And, and, and it's, it's sad that, that, I mean, I know I, I just, you know, that's the thing. I have this admiration <laughs> for Jewish, for the Jewish worldview um, and, 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 and the love of humanity uh, that, they, that they express and their desire to share everything that they come up with and that they invent and that they can do to improve all of mankind to be or goyim. Um, and at the same time, I think sometimes I just wish they could stand a bit more strongly on their rights and not give in and not uh, not give in to the uh, to the lie the the guilt trip that's constantly put on israel you've got to solve the problem you cause the problem it's not israel's fault that there's a palestinian issue and israel despite the fact i, I, I mean i could talk forever on this issue but i maybe i've made my point <laughs> so, thank you look we have uh, we have come up to time um, I want to thank you for joining us. Look, we really only touched the tip of the iceberg with you uh, today. We're, we're going to have to have you back again at some point, um, and we, we, we would love to do that. I must tell you that um, since, we, since um, we first met you, I now only talk about Judea and Samaria and not the West Bank. So thank you for uh, setting me straight on that. Um, Stan, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to catch up with you again. We do look forward to, uh, to seeing you back in Australia. So whenever that's um, going to happen and uh, we'd love to catch up with you in, in real life. Michael, do you Thank have anything you. that you want to add? Yeah, look, Stan, it was great catching up uh, with you again, even though it, uh, this time it's not in person. However, I just want to say on a personal note, and I'm saying it on a personal note, how much I appreciate having our wonderful Christian Zionist friends on side and the amazing work by way of Israel adv advocacy and uh, fighting for our Jewish human rights, uh, that you and your colleagues around the world, particularly in Israel and America, and here in Australia, it's a pity that the majority of Australian Jews are not really aware of the behind the scenes proactive work that our Christian Zionist friends are doing, lobbying in Canberra, uh, lobbying uh, with mainstream Australians for Israel. And if only our progressive left Jewish community would be as unconditionally loyal to Israel and the Jewish cause as you and your friends are, Stan. Uh, so I just want to say thanks once again. And it's a real privilege to know you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. May I wish you, may I wish you, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. And may I wish you all, Chag Pesach Sameach, 
and may you be delivered <laughs> once and for all and 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 may the almighty bless israel with shalom thank, thank, thank you, you very, thank you very much dan i'll just hand back to david for a little bit of a, a final wrap-up uh, over to you david okay look thank you very much uh uh, Stan and uh, Michael and Alan for uh, uh, hosting the program so well. Um, really, we're, we're up to time, so I'll just uh, make clear the very special event that we have coming up next week. Now, I'm sure this won't be controversial at all that we've got uh, Mark Latham uh, as our guest next week. Um, but seriously, if you're into uh, political correctness, uh, don't tune in because you won't find any next week. And we're going to be confronting some of the uh, very blunt and very controversial uh, political and social values issues uh, with none other than Mark Latham uh, next week. And I expect uh, that'll be a very big event. And finally, as we always do, uh, if anyone here is not yet supporting uh, HAA, here are the three things that we call upon you to do. Uh, join the email list because social media is becoming less reliable uh, and uh, you can just go to the website jewishassociation.org.au and subscribe for free. Um, make sure you like and follow the HAA Facebook page and of course we want everyone to assist us tangibly by uh, becoming a member and uh, making a donation. So um, back to you, Alan, and thank you. Okay, thanks, David. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks again, Stan and Michael. Uh, so until we, uh, until we see you all again next week, uh, for me, it's good night to you all. Bye for now.